What's up, my friends? Welcome to Challenging Conversations with your host, Jason Jimenez. So glad that you guys are tuning into another episode. Now, I'm excited today because I have a special guest and friend who is going to be talking about not only what is progressive Christianity, but looking even deeper into this movement known as the Christian left. And he's, wrote, he's written an excellent book that kind of dissects not only the movement itself, ideologically speaking, but practically how you as a biblical Christian can be informed about these issues and making sure that you are not being led astray. Because my friends, what we are seeing, and perhaps maybe you attend a progressive church, that you are disturbed by what is coming from the pulpit and how they say the Bible is not the infallible word of God or that Jesus isn't God or there are different paths or different roads or different ways to God. And you know, biblically, when you look at your scriptures, that that is actually false doctrine. What do you do about it? Well, hopefully we're going to be introducing some of these concepts and introducing you also to ways that you can combat these things. So we're going to have a part one where we're going to be talking about, as you can see in the title, if you're, if you're watching this podcast, is progressive Christianity biblical? And then in part two with my guest, Lucas Miles, we're going to be talking about how you can confront respectfully winsomely, logically, biblically, false doctrine that is disguising itself as though it's the gospel presented in scripture when in fact it's actually progressive Christianity. Now, as always, my friends, this broadcast is brought to you by the Edified Network. You can go to Edify and you can dot, or I, I think, yeah, it's edify.app and you can get the app and download it and you can see all of the different shows. Matter of fact, Lucas Miles has one of his shows is available also on Edify and Faithwire and elsewhere, wherever you get your podcasts. But we encourage you guys to take advantage of downloading this app and you guys will get access to so many great uh, podcasters and people doing shows that are teaching people how to defend the Christian faith and give you a a, a biblical perspective in the culture that we're living in today. So with that being said, I'm excited to be welcoming Lucas Miles. What's up, Lucas? Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Good to connect. Yeah, man. Same here, dude. Uh, now, you know, I got to tell people before we dive in. So I was actually sent your book because you never gave it to me, but a friend of mine actually <laughs> sent it to me and the Christian left. And I, I got to tell you, of course, my friends over there at Broad Street written some books with them as well. But I loved, I love the symbol that you put. Was that your idea, by the way? Now, so, now tell, uh, tell people who are listening okay. not, that they're not watching this on YouTube, but they're listening to the audio. What's the symbol in the in the word left? Yeah, so the E in the word left is, it's actually the symbol for Christian socialism. It's actually a real symbol. Yep. And it is a tilted cross in mm -hmm. place of the communist hammer and then the sickle. And so that is a, that's a symbol that Christian socialists actually utilize. Um, they have several symbols that they kind of rotate through. And I think uh, I, I had the idea for sort of the uh, um, the negative space with the uh, the the you know red and and um, black uh, uh, you know usage on the cover. Yeah. But I think it was the it was the brainchild of Broad Street folks over there to to put that in as the E. And uh, I, I had found the symbol and sent it to them, I think, and they they found yeah. the perfect spot for it. So, well, I'll just to let people know, Lucas Miles is a pastor. He's a writer, speaker, and he also uh, owns and runs his own film and uh, film company. I mean, what else are, are you running for office, dude? What else are you a doctor too? What else, Lucas? What uh, else do you do? You know what? I um I get bored easy. <laughs> I've been working on cloning myself in my basement. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's always, my joke is always, if I'm on an airplane and somebody asks me what I do, if I want to sleep, I tell them I'm a pastor because they stop talking yeah, to me stop talking. and, and, uh, if I, if I feel like talking and, you know, trying to minister to them or getting to know them or whatever, I'll tell them I'm a film producer or director or something. And then they'll go, Oh, tell me more about that. And then eventually leads to, I'm a pastor. And then they sometimes stop talking to me, but you know, <laughs> that at least gets that started, but you know, I wear a few different hats, but they all kind of uh, blend together in my world and just been really thankful for uh, some of the spheres of influence God's put us in. Well, so real quickly, before we dive into the topic about is progressive Christianity biblical and give our listeners, you know, some insight into progressive Christianity, how long have you been a pastor? Because I, I served as a pastor for about 16 years. I did family ministry and uh, just that was my calling, loved it. My wife and I loved serving with children, and then we did youth, and then college, and then started family ministry with, with couples and, and, you know, marriages issues and parenting and discipleship. What about you? Like, what was your background as a pastor? Like, when did you get started? 
So I actually started preaching when I was 17. Uh, we didn't have a youth pastor at the church I grew up at. There was an associate pastor that spent a lot of time with the students, but um, you know, it was really in addition to his you know main responsibilities. And he really sort of nurtured uh, um, a pastoral, you know, I think he saw a pastoral gift in me and nurtured that is probably a better way of saying that. And so, and oftentimes when we didn't have a youth leader of some sort, uh, I would step in, I would start speaking, leading Bible studies. Uh, they put me, you know, I did some smaller things on Sunday mornings, uh, uh, you know, while I was still in high school. Um, ended up going to school for philosophy and religious studies, went through kind of secular uh, university and uh, was, you know, very thankful for that program. It was actually uh, when I first started reading Augustine and some other mm -hmm. names through some of these philosophy classes. Um, and then did a short stint at sort of an in-house ministry training school with a church in Ohio. Uh, my wife and I planted a church in uh, 2004. Um, so I've been the senior pastor of the church that I'm at now for uh, going on 18 years. So it's, wow. uh, yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've, I'm over 20 years of, of preaching in some capacity, you know, that we've been doing this. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's so funny when you said 17, you know, I was, I graduated high school early and I did an internship in my local church. They didn't know I was kind of like, am I going to do a gap year? Yeah. A lot of my family, you know, they, none of them went to college. So I had some academic scholarships, but no, I didn't know what to do with them and nobody was telling me what to do with them. And I was kind of lost, and then I had a friend who I was doing some radio stuff, and he said, hey, why don't you come over and, and intern and try it for like a semester or whatever before you decide where to go, if you're going to leave you know, Tucson, Arizona or whatever. And I had the calling. I kind of felt that was a path that God had for me. And I unfortunately lost my mom when I was 15. She was killed in a mm. car accident. But even oh, wow. she prophetically, when I was a child, would always tell me that there was a special calling that that you're going to be teaching the bible of course that didn't make mm. sense i, I love you know the playing sports and working out and that kind of stuff of course i love jesus you know but just i just didn't know what that meant well it wasn't until after i lost her and was drawn close to the lord during the midst of a trial and then having people are pouring into me i started to serve in the local church at 17 and started to preach at 18. so that's kind of cool where you start at a young age you know what i mean and never look yeah. back you know? Yeah. You know, I, it was funny. I, and I don't think I've ever shared this on a, on a show before. So you'll, you'll get the first, uh, the first inside scoop here is I actually wanted to be a herpetologist, uh, <laughs> before, before I like really felt a call in the ministry. So I was like, I mean, I got like reptile magazine and like all this, like really nerdy stuff. And, um, and, uh, I was, I was convinced I was going to be like searching the rainforest for some newt or something like oh, that. But, that. That's uh, awesome. here, here I am. So, now, are, do you still like find yourself where you're like watching videos or checking things out with it? I like I you can take me to about any zoo in the world. And like if you cover up the names of everything, I can like tell you what all the lizards and snakes are and stuff like that. It's kind of a hidden hidden trait. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I just love animals in general and, and the outdoors. So we're, if we're traveling, we find something or see something um you know it's it's always cool to kind of discover that so god's made some really cool stuff i also did a lot of theater and acting and so that's kind of where the the film side of what i do is it, that's been there a long time too and so uh, i've now produced a couple feature films done some deals with netflix redbox walmart and some others and and uh yeah it's it's uh i i find that the older i get that you know some of these things that i thought were maybe forgotten or yeah. Um, you know, that God kind of brings those back. He has a way of just redeeming some of those things. And I, I don't plan to go searching for, you know, snakes in the Amazon anytime soon, but you never know. We'll see what happens. You know, it'd be awesome. And we should do this to get Billy Hallowell involved. We should do like one of those shows where what's that one show where the guy, he takes like certain, you know, insects and spiders and, and has them and the, he gets bit by them to kind of see his reaction. Have oh, you seen that yeah. dude? Well, we should do that I, to I, you. We should see how you handle certain bites. <laughs> For the record, Billy's afraid of everything. Yeah, so we've talked about that a lot on the church boys, yeah. like bats, <laughs> like any yeah. animal, Billy's afraid he of freaks it. Out. So yeah. I would like to put him in those situations. I think that would be really would worth be. filming. So we'll, we'll probably figure out something we could do. We could, you know, hopefully he doesn't listen to this, this uh, episode. Oh, he probably sure he will. will. That, and, we, and we just gave it away. But he'll just, he just, well, how about this? We'll just say this. Billy, we're going to come for you. You don't know what's going to happen. At some point, this is right. we're going to take you, and we're going to throw you in a bat cave or something like that. I don't know. But anyway. I have a particular set of skills. Yeah, I have a particular set of skills. So <laughs> people are wondering, like, what does that have to do with anything about pro uh, progressive Christianity? It, it actually does. We'll get there in a minute. But anyway, well, I appreciate it, man. That's kind of cool that just your background, and I just think it's important because 
you know, on the podcast, I don't want just people to think like, you know, an expert person talks about a, you know, a deep thing, you know, thanks for informing me, move on. You know, again, obviously we're human beings, right? We got lives and interests and we love to be entertained. And, you know, we love in the Christian community like this, that we can bond together, support one another, because as you know, Lucas, things are getting really ugly out there. Yeah. And particularly when it comes to even what, it, how do you even define Christian community and people that you can trust, not just look up to, but people that you can trust with God's word, where their giftedness lies and that their interest, as the Bible says, is to put people's interest above their own. So they're not just, you know, we use the term a lot, narcissistic, where it's just about them. And so I just appreciate your shepherd's heart. And again, the work that you're doing and, and, and not just, you know, articulating things intellectually, but as a shepherd, that you're coming alongside you and your wife and the team that God has put around you to invest in the lives of people. And it's messed up. We get that. Not everyone is perfect and got it all together. Uh, you know, I just was ministering to somebody even today that I go way back with in the past. And, you know, they've lived a troubled life and they want to live for Christ. And sometimes it can get, let's be honest, you can get frustrated by it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, God, God, give me patience. This person doesn't really have never really had solid examples in their life. And so I'm like a spiritual brother to them. Uh, and in some cases, even like a father figure. So just, you know, help me to speak into the life of this person. And so I just, I think that's so important because when we come to this topic, I want our listeners to know that we're just not going to take, you know, um, aim academically and disprove or dismantle positions right. that are coming from progressive Christians because I want people to know, and you and I were just talking before we, we jumped on the podcast, you and I have several friends who are progressive, you know, or on the left, you know, and, uh, you know, we get into rigorous debates, but we're respectful I learn a lot from them. I understand where they're coming from. So I'm not just reading a textbook. I know you're not just reading a textbook. So the what I wanted to start with on this particular episode, it, you know, before we defined what progressive Christianity is and look at what distinguishes them, if you will, from biblical Christianity, I noticed recently there was something that you had said in regards to progressive Christianity slash the Christian left. And you said, quote, it's really damaging. It is antithetical to the gospel and certainly heretical. And you said it is growing or metastasizing more in the Western church today. What did you mean by that in regards to progressive Christianity? And as I'm sure you explain what you mean by that, give us kind of some definitions here regarding progressive Christianity as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, this is... I always feel honored talking about a topic like this um, more because of the flip side. And that is in order to define progressive Christianity, we also have to define orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, um, that is something it's a lost word. You know, if, if you're not familiar with the term, the orthodoxy just means, you know, right thinking or right belief. Um, and so as Christians, we want to be in a place of right thinking. We want to have right beliefs about the gospel and anything outside of that you know, starts venturing into some sort of heresy. Um, the two major heresies to affect the early church were was was the Judaizers and and the Gnostics. The Judaizers were you know basically a, an upgraded version of the Pharisees, and they sort of adopted certain aspects to um, uh, the, the 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 story of Christ along with their uh, very legalistic, performance based uh, view of of uh, salvation and faith. Uh, the Gnostics were something different. They were they were progressive. They were uh, they were pushing the envelope. They were inventing new doctrines to justify uh, different lifestyles and behaviors that they that they uh, you know were uh, were vying for. They were grabbing hold of other religions and kind of adapting you know portions of what those religions taught to bring those in. And so you know really, I, I always say today that whenever you see heresy manifested in in even our modern world, it's always going to come back to within that spectrum of the Judaizers and the Gnostics. And so, you know, my first book, Good God, was really addressing um, uh, some of the lies of what, you know, could be called fundamentalism or, or legalistic Christianity. It's really kind of that Judaizer sort of mindset. Uh, this, this book here, The Christian Left, is really addressing more of the Gnostic framework uh, that we see within progressive Christianity. And so progressive Christianity, or, or, or the Christian left, as I call it, 
uh, really what that is, is it's a growing constituency of left-leaning Christians, and at times Christians by name only. I think it's important that we're not the ones deciding people or trying to judge people's salvation. Uh, there's some clear instances of people that reject Jesus or people that yeah, uh, you know, make it very clear that they're not calling upon Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I think it is safe in those instances uh, to say from what we can see uh, that those people do not appear to be Christians based upon their own confession. Um, but, but at times there's people in a spectrum caught in between. And we've talked about that, you know, a little offline, um, and that these individuals have become fixated on, um, uh, uh, progressive ideology and philosophy going all the way back to maybe, um, you know, Kant or Hegel and some different names forward, uh, things like critical theory, critical race theory, um, you know, various, uh, various forms of, you know, to use a buzzword wokeism. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also see, um, you know, with that, a couple key doctrines, um, the rejection of original sin or the depravity of man, uh, a downgraded view of scripture. Uh, they don't believe, and, and that really goes back to, if there's any, you know, kind of theology geeks listening, uh, I trace that personally uh, back to Karl Barth, who, um, although I think that he made some great contributions to the faith, um, he, one thing that he's very known for is disconnecting the belief of Jesus the word of God from the scripture where, you know, Christians for really up until that time had always viewed the word of God and the scripture and Jesus really is sort of this, you know, homogenous sort of, uh, uh, um, entity that, that the word, uh, the written word contains both that rhema, uh, and the logos, you know, that is, that is Christ. And so, uh, uh, Bart disconnected that. Mm -hmm. And although he did that to uplift Christ in doing so, I think by default he tip it, he he downgraded scripture, and that gap has only been widened from him uh, to today, where there's a very downgraded view of the of the scriptures. To where I think there's a Pew Forum account that said that uh, uh, something like it's only 24 percent of church going Christians that believe that the Bible is the inerrant, authoritative Word of God. Uh, so that means that you know uh, what is that uh, um, you know 76 percent of the church believes that the Bible is something less than the inerrant, infallible, you know, authoritative word of God. Uh, and so this is, when I say this is, you know, metastasizing, I mean, the percentages, I, I think, speak to that. It, it is spreading. Uh, we see it spread from everything from Christian publishers to Christian recording artists that are, you know, uh, going through what they call a deconversion. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Christian journalists, pastors who are, uh, you know, participating in, in supporting things like, you um, you know, critical race theory and critical theory in general, Marxism, uh, and then all the way to our Christian colleges. And so this is this is something I don't think we should take lightly. I don't think we need to necessarily go on a witch hunt, but I think we need to be aware of what it is. We need to be aware of some of the players that are that are leading this. And then we need to make sure that the church that we're in and that, you know, for our as far as our family is concerned, that we are really growing in a an established Christian message. And, you know, and I'll, I'll stop after this rant here, but Christianity is not a new faith. It's been around for 2000 years. It's well defined. Uh, you know, you and I both have a whole bunch of books, you know, behind us that that detail what is uh, what is Christian doctrine? What is what you know, where does it start and stop? And there are some primary beliefs that are imperative for something to be called Christian. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing those, um, you know, really tossed outside of the. Uh, the hot air balloon, if you will, of what is the Christian left as they soar higher and higher into this uh, progressive uh, mist that they're drifting off into. Yeah, I think that's well said, Lucas, and I appreciate it. And hopefully people listening and watching, they'll have a better grasp into progressive Christianity. And, and, and by the way, uh, to all the listeners, we will dive into that. We're going to unpack a little bit about their view of God their view of the Bible, their view of Jesus and salvation. Now, there's other angles we can take, but those are the primary, you know, because if you attack the nature of who God is based on the the Holy Scriptures, right, the the Hebrew Scriptures and what we have, what we consider to be the New Testament, you're going to have major problems because you're going to land up not having a, a God in the flesh, if you will, in the Gospels known as Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. But before we do that, Lucas, one, I want to recommend to people, there is a classic book by uh, Grisham make, Macon, you know, Christianity and Liberalism. Now, that's a good uh, book in the sense of it kind it's of— It's back you, here someplace. <laughs> yeah, you're looking for it, yeah. <laughs> but it, that's a good—and it, it's a little outdated in the sense of what we're seeing progressive Christianity today with new faces and, and, you know, social justice, more issues with social Marxism, that kind of stuff. 
but it's still nonetheless a classic book because again, his whole basis of writing that book is saying, look, uh, liberalism, the liberal theology that has been you know attached to the, the to the church for many for many years, and some denominations tend to be more liberal than others. But he says that it's a version of the gospel that doesn't align to biblical Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, uh, historic Christianity. And, and so I recommend yeah. people getting Christianity and liberalism. And he's a Presbyterian scholar, uh, Grisham Macon, J. Grisham uh, Macon. Also, I'm sure you've heard, you've, have you heard the book Kissing Fish, Christianity for People Who Don't Like Christianity? No, I actually have not. Yeah, so this is a guy named Roger Wosley, and um, I don't know how big the book has been, but when I was doing a lot of research, you know, because we're both writing books right now on this kind yeah. of stuff, and, um, you know, I, let me just read for you in the audience he, kind of a concise summary, you know, way of how he utilizes this working definition of what progressive Christianity is. So this is what Roger Wosley and his Kissing Fish Subtitle, Christianity for People Who Don't Like Christianity. Catch this. He says, progressive Christianity is an approach to the Christian faith that is influenced by post-liberalism and post-modernism and proclaims Jesus of Nazareth as Christ, Savior, and Lord. Now, I think, by the way, let's just pause, Lucas. I think it would be important. Let's let's give some insight. When, when a progressive Christian says, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus is Lord— it's like when you're not, to be exact, talking to a Jeho Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, but you have to understand what they mean by the, the word Lord, right? So we'll get to that in a minute. He goes on to say, it emphasizes the way, capital W, and teaches of Jesus. Not merely his person emphasizes God's eminence, not merely God's transcendence, leans towards, uh, leans towards panentheism rather than supernatural theism emphasizes salvation here and now instead of a primarily in heaven to be, emphasizes being saved for robust, abundant, eternal life over being saved from hell, emphasizes the social communal aspects of salvation instead of merely the personal, stresses social justice as integral to Christian discipleship, takes the Bible seriously but not necessarily literally, Embracing a more interpretive, metaphorical understanding emphasizes orthopraxy instead of orthodoxy, right actions over right beliefs. Embraces reason as well as paradox and mystery instead of blind allegiance to rigid doctrines and dogmas. Does not consider homosexuality to be sinful and does not claim that Christianity is the only valid or viable way to connect to God is non-exclusive, end quote. So that's kind of a... Working definition from Roger Wosley, who is obviously clearly a progressive Christian. Just your thoughts, I and mean, that's pretty comprehensive in a, in a in summary fashion. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think it's fair. I mean, if anything, I think it's more uh, generous and respectful than than uh, I think that they, the times they deserve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and, and look, I believe I want to be clear. Like you know, we talked about this before we started. I believe in being respectful towards people. Absolutely. I believe in even when we disagree with somebody, of never acting in a way that destroys their dignity um you know and and when i wrote the christian left i i actually wrote the whole book and gave it to a couple of really trusted friends uh that you know are, are, have a lot more experience and have been in this a lot longer than i have and they all came back and said the exact same thing they said lucas this is so good it's what's needed it's gonna be a big hit you don't even know it and but it's missing a chapter and like Every single one of them in their own words kind of said the same thing. And and they all had the same suggestion. You have to name names. And and I didn't want to do it, you know, because I was afraid of that. Uh, not not because I was afraid of, you know, re repercussions of the, addressing these people. But I, I, I wanted to be loving. I wanted to be kind. And and I think that it's important that we talk about these things. We recognize that, you know, those like to 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 say something like, orthopraxy over orthodoxy it's true i mean he's spot on in that definition but i think the average person can hear that and go i still don't know who we're talking yeah. about or what that looks like yeah and you know i'll have people a lot of times that will go oh so you mean like joel osteen and i'm going like no that's not what i mean like i don't like, when i think of the christian left joel osteen is not somebody that comes to mind you know i don't i he's not he's maybe not the the, the most gifted theologian which he would say about himself and you might not agree with all of his beliefs, 
but I don't see him and, and, and immediately put him into this category. You could maybe accuse him of being Christian light at times, but I don't think that's the same as the Christian left. And, and so um, one of the things that helped me was just seeing some of Paul's epistles and recognizing like that he, he addressed those who were in error, especially those that had influence over his flocks and over people that he was shepherding. And he would make warnings like, look out for Alexander the metal worker you know, and, and, and others that he kind of points attention to. And so uh, I think that this is an important topic. I think that definition is, is very, is very solid from an academic, you know, standpoint. And I think that, you know, now the, the work that's left to us is really breaking that down in a way that, that people can really grab a hold of that and, and have a way for that to practically guide, you know, um, where they attend church on a Sunday morning or, or, you know, what they believe about certain topics themselves. Yeah, and, and so let's do that. Obviously, the podcast is Challenging Conversations off of my book, and, and like you, and that's one thing, again, I, I stress this, Lucas, and I will tell our listeners the same thing. You know, we are to speak the truth in love. That's what Ephesians 4.15 says. And so when we have to name names sometimes, it's what is your intent? And as Paul told Timothy, and this is so important for people, he says, hey, have a good conscience, right? Sincere faith you know, in a labor of love in the, how you're presenting things. And so when we do that, it's not to rip on someone just recently. Cause I'd done a video on my YouTube channel, not too long ago with, with Steve Furtick. And, you know, I live in Charlotte. This is where he's based. And of course we have a lot of crossover, a lot of friends of his, or, you know, I know, you know, donors who support Stan Strong Ministries who, who go to Elevation. And so even that I was very reluctant. And the reason why was because it got to a point where there was so much he had been saying for quite some time. Now, would I put him in a progressive Christian category? Um, perhaps to some degree. And this is why, because and this whole view here, based on this definition from Roger uh, Mosley, um, or Wosley, is panentheism, the view of God, right? Because as you and I know, when you do study theology, there are preconditions to how we approach certain subject matters, and it's our view of what, who God is, you know? Yeah. Uh, who he is matters and how we interpret the text moving forward on anything, you know, especially, and again, this is a bigger term, the metaphysical preconditions that we have of God's non-moral attributes and his, his moral attributes and defining him. Uh, and when I say defining him, not that we're putting him in a box, but understanding his characteristics, what he has revealed in natural revelation, special revelation from scripture. And when you have someone like Furtick, who, again, like you said, I pray for him. Um, some of his leaders I've known, they're friends of mine, they're buddies, you know, we text each other. Um, I've never told somebody outright, like, you got to, leave that church now. That has to be their conviction. Now, if they ask me, are there any concerns you have about their teaching? Now, let's be clear, their ecclesiology, I don't support biblically because the Bible clearly teaches to have elders. They have none. There is no, there are no elder system. Mm. You and I as both as pastors, when we have served and you, we have elders. We have, yeah. uh, you know, you have uh, not just an advisory board, but there's an accountability. Those are also shepherds. So there's not just this celebrity pastor, this primary guy. I'm not saying everything he teaches is false, but when he teaches, catch this, Exodus 3, 14, when God told Moses, remember the great self-existent, I am that I am, I am who I am, the self-existence of God. He tells his congregation, when God said that to, to Moses, he was saying, as I am, you are. Right. And when he says to people that God created us so that we would know that he exists, otherwise he'd be an abstract theory. I, I This is from the mouth of Furtick. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, when we do have disagreements biblically and you lay them out, we want to do it respectfully. And that's what I, I want us to do here because in challenging conversations, because that I've had a lot of good conversations since then about Furtick, and I've told everybody, I'm not saying that he's a bad pastor. I'm not saying he doesn't love his congregation. I'm not saying that God didn't give him the vision to start the church. What I can point out is this panentheistic view that he's having of God, which actually just coincides with what we just read about a progressive Christian's view. They're not like theistic in their understanding of God. They're panentheistic of their view of God. So let's start with God. How would you... 
go about explaining a progressive, typically, right, a progressive Christian's view of just God in general? You know, I mean, and I think we're kind of identifying here and and slowly hammering this out is that there's a spectrum. And you have some figures that have uh, fairly traditional orthodoxy who have maybe um, uh, sort of flopped or folded on issues such as maybe, uh, um, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's something like an LGBT, you know, Q issue or, uh, you know, kind of within that gender and sexuality debate or uh, maybe just initially it's, uh, um, you know, I think the first one to go for a lot of people is a uh, is a is a you know, six day creation, seventh day rested, um, you know, framework. And then mm-hmm. it starts kind of adopting, uh, you know, they start adopting maybe more of an evolutionary mindset that that to me is a is a gateway for a lot of people into progressive ideology. And I always say, if we doubt God in the first chapter of the Bible, what's going to prevent us from doubting or uh, revising maybe later chapters that we see? And so, you know, you're starting scripture from already a a, a negative, um, you know, application or negative framework to what's there. So um, typically what we see within progressive Christianity or the Christian left is that um, they have adopted, uh, oftentimes they lean a little bit more towards a universalist mm-hmm. um, mindset. So for instance, I was just watching, um, uh, before we jumped on here, I, I had to run over uh, to uh, uh, pick something up in an office. I was sitting in the waiting room and they had the Colin Powell um, uh, funeral service on. And the pastor there in the Washington Cathedral, um, you know, is is kind of, you know, making his opening statements. And he makes a statement, which seems, you know, a very innocent, unless you really are listening for these things, of this is a church that we believe is for all people. Yeah. And, you know, if I were to say that in my church, people would know what I mean is everybody is welcome here and it doesn't matter what your background is, but we have a very, a very uh, specific understanding to what is salvation, what is freedom in Christ. And we want to invite you on that journey with us and you can come however you are, but we believe that, you know, by engaging here and hopefully engaging with God, you're going to leave transformed and changed forever and it's going to affect your eternity. Um, when I hear progressives say that, usually what is behind that in most cases I find is that there is a sense that um, all roads lead to God, this universalist sort of mindset, uh, and that Christianity is my preferred way, or maybe Christianity is the true way, but other you can find God through these other alternative ways in terms of how you're uh, approaching him. And he is still sort of in that. It becomes very pantheistic uh, in that mindset. And to me, that goes back to somebody like Hegel that had adopted, you know, some of those pantheistic views that God is sort of in everything and that all these roads lead to him. Uh, I think when it when it comes to the person of Jesus itself, uh, um, that doctrine um, that there is a tendency to adopt a uh, um, a modernized version of what is known as the quest for the historical Jesus. And if that's a term people aren't familiar with, the, if I said, you know, if I walked in the average church in America and said, do you believe in the historical Jesus? Most people are going to raise their hand. Well, that's kind of a weird way to ask, but I think so. You know, he was a real person. He lived in yeah. history. And, but the historical Jesus is a theological term developed really on the, on the, the, the coattails of the enlightenment um, where Basically, what was being uh, meant by that is that um, it was a rational view of Scripture, meaning they were reading Scripture with the intent to cross out any of the miraculous, anything that appeared supernatural, because as rational beings, they believed that those things could never happen. So they were trying to sort of sort through Scripture as sort of this literary archaeologist to put together a framework or a portrait of the real Jesus absent from any sort of Christian mythology or exaggeration that might appear in the text. And they were left with a Jesus that I present is, um, you know, I describe it as often, uh, he's more of a social reformer than the yep. savior of the world. Yep. And, and that, you know, so I think when, when somebody says, I believe in Jesus even more any, you know, today, we almost have to ask the question of which Jesus, yep. you know, uh, the Jesus that, 
Aryan Christianity supported, you know, who was the great champion of the state, uh, the Jesus of black liberation theology um, that that hated white people and supported throwing Molotov cocktails into, uh, quote, Whitey's storefront, the founder James Cohn said, <laughs> or uh, or the Jesus that we find in Scripture. Who, you know, who was God in the flesh, who was born of a virgin, that gave his life, that on the third day rose from the dead, victorious, um, and, and forever dealt with the issue of sin um, between God and man uh, for all those who put faith in him. Which Jesus are we talking about? And, you know, although there is a spectrum, I think that a lot of these beliefs have sort of, um, they've, they've tainted the waters of the theological understanding of Christ, oftentimes in a way that I don't think is, is perceivable even by those that are believing it. I don't know as though many progressive Christians, especially those that are closer to the Orthodox fringes than they are maybe say the Marxist fringes of the equation, I don't think that they realize how the history that is behind all of this and how these doctrines have been shaped over time to arrive to where they're at. And so that's something that I really have a passion of helping people work through that uh, to recognize, like, why do I believe what I believe? Is it because it's biblical, or is it because it's 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 had a genesis in some other philosophy or or alternative, you know, um, uh, belief structure that sort of you know found its way into my worldview? Yeah, and so that so to your point, if for people to understand, when they when they think of God, like you said, God is is more or less could be an abstract theory, could be a spiritual being that de definitely is not manifested in the triune Godhead, right? Of father, son, Holy spirit, you know, the three in one, uh, right. they deny that because, you know, as you pointed out with Jesus in essence, and this is, you know, again, boiling it down from the perspective of a progressive Christian, Jesus is not the second person of the Trinity because there is no Trinity. Now he's a manifestation. That's the key word. He's a manifestation of God, right? But he's not God. And yeah. so for people to understand, they deny the virgin birth. They deny the deity of Jesus. They, de they deny the sinlessness of Jesus. And when you take a huge figure, right, Lucas, f on the left, on liberal theology, progressive Christians, is Marcus Borg, who in his way of taking the quest of Jesus when you're looking at Albert Schweitzer and stuff, when you're separating yeah. the historical Jesus from the Jesus of faith or the Christ of faith. So they start, what they do, and people need to understand, like going back to Lord and Savior, how they interpret those views is not how we interpret them biblically. When we say Lord and Savior, when, when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, he's proclaiming, he's announcing Jesus who is God in the flesh, who conquered sin and death and rose again on the third day. But Marcus Borg likes to take the terminology in the pre-Easter Jesus, right? In the post-Easter, almost like Christianity invented this savior figure. <laughs> right. Yep. You yep. know, and, and so, that's the belief of a lot of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so I want to read to you Marcus Borg from his book, Jesus Uncovering the Life Teachings and Surprising Relevance of a Spiritual Revolutionary. This is what Marcus Borg, who passed away a few years ago, he writes, he brings enlightenment a religious metaphor that many people associate primarily with Asian religions. But enlightenment is central to John's gospel and to early Christianity. More generally, John announces it, announces it in a magnificent and thematic prologue to his gospel. Catch this. He says, Jesus is the, quote, the true light which enlightens everyone who, quote, was coming into the world, end quote. That was on page 197 from his book, Jesus Uncovering the Life Teachings and Surprising Relevance of a Spiritual Revolutionary. So notice that it's very poetic yeah. in how they come across with Jesus. Like he's this beautiful man, but it's not really, again, the second person of the Trinity, is it? You know, look, there, there's so much evidence for the person of Jesus. You know, even um, uh, people like, um, uh, oh, his name's escaping me right now, um, uh, 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 Bart Ehrman, you know, who is um, really sort of a, a you know, at, 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 you know, probably an atheist who writes about um, Jesus and Christianity, this historical Jesus, he would even go as far to say that anyone who tries to state that there was not a man named Jesus who lived on earth 
in the first century who was this this uh you know controversial figure and that a lot of this is built around in the first century that that's ignorant and so you know even some of the most oppositional scholars to the lordship and the divinity of christ they realize they can't get around the existence of jesus and so i think the easier thing to do for them is to rather than discount him entirely is to really flatter him to uh to speak to him to uh, um to play into his existence um uh, but then to add to that all of these fabricated notions uh, a lot of this comes from and I, this is not my specialty I, I i know enough to to know where i stand on it but there's some other thinkers out there that are much more gifted uh, um, than I would be at this. A lot of this comes back to the acceptance of what's called the, uh, the gospel of Q, which is basically in my estimation, an imaginary, um, book of the Bible that never actually existed, uh, that is used to try to draw out all these sort of maybe hidden ideas. Um, and it's proposed to be a lost, uh, pre-existent gospel that's there. Uh, there's really no evidence nor proof for it. Um, uh, there's there's some great resources out there debunking that, um, but that is taught in almost every single Bible college in the country. Is they will spend time, uh, oftentimes on the first day of uh, any sort of critical theology or critical study of Scripture class, you know, learning about the Gospel of Q, and it it there's there's no it it doesn't exist. It is it is a it is a total, from my estimation, uh, uh, you know, fragment of. Uh, um, uh, uh, or just, you know, it, 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 it's just false. It does. It's, it's a, it's make believe story. And, and so, um, individuals like whether it be Erdman or, you know, you might even see this with a guy like Richard Rohr at times, they'll grab a hold of these elements and, you know, begin to, um, uh, just weave this, uh, fantastical picture of this guy, Jesus, this, this barefoot hippie who loved everybody. And he was, you know, had kind of a prophetic streak to him and was sort of an in times, uh, you know, prophet, but, but not God. Mm -hmm. And, and there is, um, they go to great lengths to try to, you know, to dismantle. And that's what a lot of this is about. It's deconstructionism. It's about deconstructing the scriptures, right. deconstructing the faith. Uh, and I always say that, you know, a proper teaching of theology, Jesus said that he was going to tear down the temple. But then he said he was going to rebuild it in three days. If we're really helping people, we we might at times need to dismantle some false beliefs, but we need to make sure that we go back through and repair it later. And what we rarely see with with those on the left is any sort of repair of theology. Uh, it's typically just a dismantling and they leave it, you know, in, in shambles when they go on. Yeah, that's well said. I appreciate you sharing that as we're closing out to, to just remind people of, again, some of these sources uh, supposed sources, right, like the Q or the combination theory of, of things that come into effect outside of Scripture. So the Scripture has its credibility, if you will. It exists because of these other sources that no longer exist. And it also depletes the eyewitness account or the cooperation that we see within yeah. the Synoptic Gospels. And that's their intent. Uh, like Bart Ehrman, by the way, so people understand, is he believes, yeah, that as, as Lucas rightly pointed out, he defends the actual existence of a Jesus, but he denies in some cases the Jesus of Nazareth, and he also denies that Jesus claimed to be God, right? Never did he ever claim to be God. And then with that, he believes that Paul was the one that triumphed over James, the half-brother of Jesus, to erect a Christianity that, that we actually live out today. So even there's bits and pieces where you're like, yeah, I agree with Bart, then I don't. But you do see, like you said, Lucas, that feeds into the Christian left. That's their narrative. These are the sources they're getting their stuff from. And so ultimately, real quickly, salvation. So what in the eyes of a progressive Christian is salvation then? Well, let me just say that, that what you described about uh, Ehrman is, is very similar to what Hitler believed <laughs> about the Aryan Christ. Yeah. And it, I mean, he he taught that it was Paul that came in and messed everything up. I mean, if you read his his uh, um, book Table Talk, it's about seven hundred pages of complete insanity from Hitler. Uh, he shares all about faith, all about his perspective of Jesus, and shares almost identical thoughts to that. And so, you know, where do we really want to align ourselves? And that's a little bit of an ad hominem, uh, uh, you know, argument, but but I think it, it's nonetheless, you know, uh, uh, worth looking at. Um, so, when it comes to salvation. Uh, because there is not an acceptance of original sin, mm -hmm. um, salvation is something that is, 
oftentimes it's just it's just it's deserved. Um, it's it's not. Whereas as believers, you know, we're in a constant state of yes, I am now the righteousness of Christ or righteousness of God in Christ Jesus right. through the cross. But I also am aware that apart from Christ, that I got nothing going for me and I don't deserve anything but hellfire forever. And and so um, or what I like to say, go into hell in gasoline underwear. You know, I mean, that's <laughs> that's what we really deserve. And uh, but but uh, the Christian left has more of a mindset. You won't hear talk of repentance, of forgiveness of sins. You won't hear talk of these things because they don't believe in original sin. And so it, it almost gets into some of these. Uh, um, uh, you know, early heresies that the church dealt with, um, that really Augustine sort of laid to rest that this idea that that uh, man is righteous from birth, um, and that there is no need for, you know, for repentance from any sort of depravity or, or sinfulness. And I think that that is that allows a very, you know, what what the Germans called positive Christianity mm -hmm. to develop, and, and that is free from some of these messier aspects of having to ask for forgiveness or ask for, you know, uh, uh, to be saved. And really, from my estimation, the only people the, the Christian left seem to think aren't saved are, are Orthodox Christians, you know, that somehow have to repent of their bigotry or something because they, you know, they don't believe in uh, uh, pro-choice doctrines or open borders or something like that. And so uh, it's a very, it's a very distorted, confused doctrine um, that really has um, very little emphasis on the salvation process. Um, and that kind of goes into that whole Unitarian Universalist sort of framework um, that everybody's saved, they just don't know it yet. And, and so therefore, you know, a, uh, if we're really going to walk in love, we have to cater to all of these sort of social, you mm -hmm. know, identities and, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, identity politics sort of narratives. Well, I think that's well said again, and I so appreciate, Lucas, that we kind of gone a little over than we normally do, but it's such a, a rich topic, and I think what would be important for our listeners is just what you said. Let's now transition into the next podcast, you know, you know, next time when you guys tune into Challenging Conversations, where we will then start talking about the social aspects of what a progressive Christian is doing, like you said, through uh, things like social justice, et cetera, and how they view Jesus and then how they're expecting us through, even as we're recording this with the pandemic, with COVID and masks and vaccinations and, you know, charitable things with, you know, the homeless, et cetera, and how they define Christianity in, in, in that light. So Lucas, once again, thank you for joining me, my friend. I appreciate your input. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Well, my friends, that's going to do it for Challenging Conversations. Appreciate you guys listening and for your support. As always, you can go to standstrongministries.org and you can go to my main website of the ministry. Check out my books, articles, videos, podcasts that we do to help equip you and embolden you to stand strong in your faith. And again, this show is brought to you by the Edify Network. So you can go to Edify dot app and you can download the app if you have not done so already so that way you guys can be listening to podcasts such as mine as well as uh, lucas miles show and other shows that are available so thank you guys for watching until next time keep standing strong my friends